This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Uh, our last speaker is Roger Chen, winner of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2008 for the discovery and development of the green fluorescent protein, GFP. Roger began his career in science when he was six or seven years old. His father bought him a chemistry set, which led to his discovery of science books in the elementary school library. This, in turn, resulted in his sketching experiments in a notebook when he was eight years old. Although he was unable to get the notebook published, the, the original now resides in the Nobel Museum. Roger's career in science progressed nicely through high school. In his senior year, he won the first of his many honors by winning the nationwide Westinghouse Science Talent Search. Although he remains mystified how he won, because he now considers the, his project to have been scientifically unsound. <laughs> of course, it has been onward and upward ever since. When it came time to go to college, Roger went to Harvard. Interestingly, he chose Harvard over Caltech, in part because Harvard had a better music department. And he did take music theory and chamber music performance classes there. He also took economics classes. But unlike Rob, he resisted the temptation to pursue an economics career. Roger decided to leave Cambridge, Massachusetts for Cambridge University in England for graduate study, where he also did his postdoctoral work. Because of Prime Minister Thatcher's austerity program, there were few faculty positions available in England when Roger completed his postdoc. So he decided to return to the US and found a position at UC Berkeley. Now, public universities in the US at that time were also dealing with financial challenges. So Berkeley was unable to provide the f research facilities that Roger needed. As a result, UCSD was able to entice him in eight, 1989 to join the chemistry and biochemistry department, the Department of Pharmacology, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, all at UCSD. In Roger's words, UCSD was much younger, roomier, faster growing, and less tradition bound than Berkeley. We are indeed, indeed very fortunate that we could attract Roger to UCSD. In the words of an anonymous reviewer, his contributions have brought considerable acclaim to our faculty and institution. Moreover, he has been an outstanding departmental citizen and a teacher who has shown an abiding commitment to academic endeavors that are not necessarily connected to his research. Please join me in welcoming Roger Chen. I realize it's very late, and I'll try to go through this quickly, and hopefully I'm lucky that my research it tends to be fairly visual, so uh, I can just show you some movies. Um, so the first is to uh, thank the creature that really perhaps should have gotten a Nobel Prize, which is Equoria Victoria, this jellyfish. Uh, here shown swimming uh, in an aquarium. I have to confess that though it's famous and its scientific role is because it glows when disturbed. Every so often here you see the flash that is not the flash of the jellyfish, that is children pushing the button that changes the lighting at the Monterey Bear Aquarium. <laughs> <laughs> and two of these guys are having a race to the bottom of the tank. You see the other one's coming up fast in the inside lane. Uh, as I said, the, the jellyfish um, glows when it's disturbed, and that attracted the interest of this man, uh, Osamu Shimomura, uh, and he was interested in the mechanism of glowing, and that's what he mainly worked on. Uh, but in his paper that he first described the glowing protein, Ikorin, he also mentioned that there was this contaminant in the jellyfish that actually was somewhat hard to separate, and that this protein uh, took the, uh, could absorb uh, ultraviolet or blue light and turn it into green. 
and Corin actually glows blue originally, so they worked as a could work as a pair. And uh, I don't have a picture of Osamu from 1962. I have a picture of him from 2008 at the rehearsal, where here he is holding a tube of uh, GFP. He has perhaps the last tube in the world that was actually made out of real jellyfish, and I believe there's about 20,000 jellyfish died to make this tube. And here, this is, uh, here is the uh, uh, UV hand UV lamp that he uses to show uh, how it, the, the protein can glow. The next major step was that this man in the middle here, Douglas Prasher in 1992, uh, cloned the gene for GFP, uh, which Shimamura declined to do. Uh, Prasher was more of a molecular biologist and uh, decided that he would find the DNA that encoded this protein. Uh, and uh, there's a long story of, uh, of tremendous personal irony here that uh, Doug Prasher uh, uh, did not make tenure at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, his grants were not renewed uh, and uh, he uh, dropped out of science very shortly thereafter. But he at least did publish the gene uh, and uh, the, the cloning. And the two people basically in the world read the paper with any care and one of them was me and the other was Marty Chalfie. Uh, so the, we are the ones who then took up the story. But you might ask why Prasher did not, and uh, therein is a long story that perhaps has the fact to do with it, that he did drop out of science and that unfortunately the Nobel is never given to four people. So Marty was the first one uh, to uh, uh, show that Prasher's gene could be put into other organisms and would make a glowing protein, uh, and that was done in 1994. Uh, actually, a month later, Fred Suji right here at SIO uh, did the same thing, but he was a month later. Uh, and our contribution was eventually to do many things, but partly to change the color of GFP into this entire panel and to fix up the deficiencies of the original jellyfish protein, which the jellyfish made for its own purposes and not to help biologists, and it needed a lot of fixing up to do. But at that still, one could regard all what we did as relatively derivative, but you know, um, for some reason they decided to include me. Uh, and uh, we came up with some fun names for all of these. Uh, which these names, these are all turns out from coral rather than from jellyfish, and uh, some very clever Russians discovered that the corals also have homologs of the jellyfish. The jellyfish never could get us beyond this yellow-green, uh, but the uh, corals got us to uh, the, the rest of the spectrum. And so this is where things stood in 2004. And if I can explain very in one slide, you know, who cares? So what? So you've got these colors. Well, they are glowing. If you may have seen this picture here, they've all been illuminated with other wavelengths of light. They are not toxic. And they're, the key is that they are pigments that we can teach nearly any cell or organism how to make. The only exceptions are those that you can't put genes into or that can't tolerate oxygen from the air. Uh, the, these colors then form labels that we can tag any protein, just about any protein you want or any cell within an organism or even an entire organism if you can genetically modify it. And that way we can watch the living protein cell organism do its thing. It's, we can watch its life history. We can detect when genes are turned on and off. And, and a particular favorite of mine is that we can engineer these proteins to make them artificially sensitive to nearly any biochemical, other biochemical signal inside cells, such as the acidity, the pH, that is, the calcium level, the kinase activity. This is enzymes that put phosphate groups on, enzymes that tear proteins apart. Just any time an enzyme, or a protein snuggles up into another one, we can also uh, see that by engineering these fluorescent proteins. And I'll give you just two examples that are, happen to be nice visual pictures. I don't say that they're the most profound scientifically, but for this audience, I thought vision uh, uh, fun pictures are, are, are good. So these are, this is a zebrafish embryo that has been uh, transfected. We have put the DNA in other, in other words, to teach this embryo how to make a special molecule that will change color when it sees calcium ions. And we're going to watch this embryo as it begins to divide in its first steps to becoming a fish from just a single cell. And if I can run the movie here. The first thing that happened is that you notice it, it when it began to divide, a band of red spread across, and that band is is maintained at the belt where it's tightening. And in fact, this is the signal to tighten the belt. And as if I were to do this and tighten and tighten and tighten until I eventually was pinched into two. 
Um, and calcium was the trigger for that, and this keeps going. And the next cell division, which is going to be here, once again, the red color, which is the high calcium, presages the formation of that cleavage furrow. And then the next one is coming, and that's split here and here. And we go into the eight cell stage, and next is the 16 cell stage coming up, and then there's some more. And at this stage, it begins to just get visually muddy because there's so many divisions piled up on top of each other, you can't resolve them anymore. But the procedure continues. And this is really the beginning of life for all of us, all vertebrates. Uh, just happens the zebrafish are transparent and they make nice pictures. And here's another example, again, from a former postdoc at Sushi Milwaukee, where he made a different set of molecules that now tell you whether a cell is getting ready to divide or has just divided or is finished. And that's using the, our biochemical knowledge of the steps in triggering division versus quiescence, then going to division. In other words, the cell's business cycle, you might say, except that we see it in color. And he chose this as pretty colors. He had some choice, and so I I think he made it nice and memorable. Green means go, red means stop in quiescence. Uh, and you know, it could have been the other way around, but traffic lights work this way, so it's easier to remember. And here are two cells, and one of them is red, which means it's taking a break, and this one's about to divide. And now I'm gonna show you one week's worth of data compressed into a few seconds as we watch. And each one of these cells cycles between green and red and green and red and green and red as you watch them. It is green just before it divides and then it goes into a red phase and then back into green and so on just as before it divides with intermediate colors of orange and yellow as it goes back and forth up and down. And you see the date has gone from Friday to Thursday, and you have this whole mix of cells at different stages. Now, you may ask, why did we need to see this? After all, if you have a complete movie, in retrospect, you can trace out when each cell divided, because you could play the movie back and check. But this tells you a prediction. Now, it's almost like what we were just hearing about. Uh, this will predict by the color whether it's going to divide very soon or not. And I, I think these business cycles are great, but I wish I knew what was going to happen next month. <laughs> That's what we would all wish, and it's a lot easier to plot them in retrospect. Let me point out that fluorescent proteins are also good educational tools, even down to the high school and elementary school classroom, and we uh, have helped launch an outreach program here from UCSD called BioBridge that tries to take experiments like this out into the schools, because these are pretty you know, easy experiments and they have a nice visual feedback. The students can see, in this case, bacterial colonies glowing cherry lipstick red, and by making a little change, they can turn the red back into green or make it colorless or so on. So they can see the principles of mutation, genetic engineering, biochemistry with their own hands, and the fact that it made a recent Nobel Prize makes them happier because they feel they're near the cutting edge and not just studying stuff that was discovered 100 years ago by uh, Mendel or someone like that. So this is spreading through San Diego County. I just want to mention that uh, I want to be the first one to tell you the limitations. Fluorescent proteins have been good, but they also have some bad and some ugly features, not really nasty in the sense of society, but uh, though they revolutionized basic biomedical sciences in the way I just described, there is one organism that is the most difficult to put DNA into, and that is the human being. It's not because it's scientifically difficult, but it is ethically not something we're going to allow. If you are sick and going to the hospital and I want to treat you, are you going to volunteer to have DNA put into you, uh, which would be a form of gene therapy? Furthermore, humans are too thick and opaque for fluorescence of the sort I showed you, which is why we were, the, our colleagues worked on zebrafish, which are transparent. Uh, so between the genetic engineering and the thickness and opacity of most of us, uh, we have to, for solving disease problems uh, for actual sick people. Now this is distinct from under, basic research to understand disease, but to, to actually try to treat people, we still need other non-genetic methods. And this is more of what I've gone back to in my career, having had my fling with the genetically encoded ones. And I'll just show you an example of what we're trying to do. Here is a mouse 
that actually has a tumor in there. I'm sorry, it's a bit dark, but most of you would not be able to see where the tumor begins and ends. Uh, it's really, of course, it's so dark you can't see anything at all, but trust me, it's not easy to see. There, okay, sorry, there, it's a little bit brighter, and even then, you wouldn't have an easy time seeing where the tumor begins and ends. But when we switch into fluorescence mode, and this is a special types of dyes attached to peptides that we are injecting into the mouse, this is not genetic, this is not GF, anymore, but we're trying to do the equivalent with things that can be done on human beings. Now you can see the boundaries of the tumor, sort of. Uh, they're not crisp because it sort of fades away as, at the edges, but the bright fluorescence indicates where the enzymes are active in this uh, cancer. And then when we go on a little further, now we can superimpose these two views in the fluorescence. We false color green and superimpose it on the rest of the mouse. And then it looks as if it had GFP in it, but it really isn't. It's something we injected. And this helps the surgeon go along and cut out the tumor. There's the regular white light view that surgeons have always had. And now in the false color view with the green, it becomes much easier to cut out the tumor relatively accurately because you just want to get rid of all the green stuff. So if this is the white light view, hard to know where the boundaries are here, it's much better. We're revealing the nerve here, but unfortunately, uh, soon we're going to see two branches of this nerve. But in regular white light, you don't know that there's an extra hidden branch of the nerve that's here. It's invisible in white light. There's the white light view, but only when we turn on the fluorescence can we see that there's this extra branch using a separate molecule that lights up the nerves. And so we use the second molecule to tell us where not to cut, and the first molecule that finds the tumor to tell us what to get rid of. And you need both of that those pieces of information. So uh, let me switch now to some pontificating. Uh, my version uh, is what are some lessons for young scientists? Try to put your neuroses to constructive use. Now what I mean by neuroses I didn't have time to go into is but one of them for example is that uh, though I like to play the piano I am really not very dexterous in the lab, especially with micromanipulators. And my failure at that was a cause for a lot of this chemistry, to find a way of putting dyes or colors into animals without poking the cells and trying to keep them alive while I injected stuff out of this uh, super microscopic tip. Uh, I'm not very good at that. I hate it. So uh, I you know, put this neurosis to constructive use. Also, the, why am I a chemist? Well, it's partly because my father was a mechanical engineer uh, and my older their brothers were electrical engineers and they sort of took over all the sort of chemistry, uh, the, the uh, engineering and electrical space and so on. And I was a sort of scientifically inclined. The one thing that they all hated, all of my brothers and my father, was chemistry. So I, I, as the youngest child, I was forced to find the ecological niche. There's a whole book on this subject, by the way, the effect of birth order. Uh, try to find projects that give you some sensual pleasure, and you may have noticed that I do love pretty colors. Uh, accept that your batting average will be low, hopefully not zero, and that when you do succeed, uh, it's often for the wrong reasons. You have to learn to make lemonade from lemons, and sometimes persistence pays off, and if I had time, I could go through example after example where nature gave, fed us some disappointing result, but fortunately, we were able to use that to our advantages. Um, prizes are ultimately a matter luck, so avoid being motivated or impressed by them. You have to go for the things that will, you know, please your own gut because the chance that you will get a prize is so low, uh, that's not an acceptable uh, reward to risk ratio, shall we say. And of course, you've got to find the right collaborators and exploit them in a kind way for mutual benefit. <laughs> So um, let me a little, go back through a little history, some of which actually has to do with UCSD. People are always asking Nobel laureates, was it a complete surprise when you got the call from Stockholm? And I have to admit, it was not. It was an extremely annoying uh, thing because several days earlier, the, the, the practice now of this news agency called Thomson Reuters is to make their picks of who they think deserves the Nobel Prize, at least in the, uh, um, the physics, chemistry, and medicine subjects. I'm not sure if they do economics. But they probably do. 
And they had predicted these three people, Charlie Lieber, Krzysztof Mariszewski, and me. Now, we work on completely different areas, so we can never share it, but they were hedging their bets and tried to pick three different areas. And based on this, was enough for reporters like the Union Tribune also already wanting interviews. What does it feel like to be tipped as a Nobel laureate? And I said, the answer is really, go away. I don't want, you know, to have any, um, you know, chickens counted before they hatch. That's the surest way to make sure it won't happen, right? To have people count on it. But UCSD Public Relations insisted they wanted to get ready. They ordered a cake <laughs> with green, green icing, you know, in honor of GFP. And, you know, I thought this was a really dumb idea because especially, you know, and I had some, you know, day-by-day -day prediction. I could check their, the likelihood of their predictions. Uh, on Medicine is always announced on Monday, and not one of their three candidates, Thomson Reuters, was right. And then physics on Tuesday, and again, they struck out completely. Uh, so, you know, the likelihood that they're going to be right on Wednesday is pretty dismal. Furthermore, I must admit that I had been forced to go through an audition in spring of 2006 where I was holed up in front of the Swedish Royal of Academy of Sciences. Well, I have to admit, I, you know, I wasn't resisting that hard. Very few people turned down an invitation to speak in front of the Royal Academy of Sciences. And after that talk, which was you know, a summary of what we'd done, including that picture of all the colored tubes and being taken out to dinner, nobody would talk to me. And they all sort of sat there like bumps on a log, and I tried to make polite conversation about, you know, what areas of chemistry were they interested, blah, blah, blah. Um, but no, it was pretty sad failure, so I was sure I'd flunked it. Um, so it was pretty surprising then when I got a phone call at 2.25 in the morning on October 8th, a warning that there would be a press conference in 20 minutes held in Stockholm that I would be participating by phone, and I had to participate because Asamu and Marty were not answering their telephones. <laughs> uh, and they had the advantage that it was 5.25 in the morning there and not 2.25, and I think they could have done their, their, their part, but they, they laid it all on me by you know, sleeping through their alarm clocks or phones. So groggily, I, I, um, I had to, you know, rouse myself from a, admittedly, I had taken a sleeping pill precisely not to be bothered by all of this, and I had to, uh, you know, come up with something to say to the world's press. Um, it's a, a real challenge to keep the lab running. It, I never really managed to acknowledge the congratulations properly, uh, and I really don't know how Paul Krugman, who was the economics winner for that year, how the hell does he manage to meet two or three deadlines a week for the New York Times? he still manages to do it. Of course, there's some strange moments, like uh, the traditionally American Nobel laureates get invited to the White House. We were in, Wendy and I were in some doubt whether we should even go and, and you know, go to meet this man, but he had, you know, after Obama had just you know, shaken his hand after winning the election, so who were we to, to, ref to consider ourselves <laughs> higher and mightier? And the man does have, a, I have to say, uh, Mr. Bush did have a very good sense of humor. At one stage, he put his arm around Paul Krugman, who you know has attacked Bush vitriolically in the newspaper, and Bush said, well, and as the photo photographers were clicking away, he said, uh, Professor Krugman, I think your grandchildren will enjoy this picture, <laughs> or something like that. And, and so here are my pictures. Uh, that's the king shaking my hand, uh, and I have just checked with Rob Engel, and we agreed that neither of us heard what the king has to say. And I, um, I've heard that from other laureates as well, that he mumbles something, and we're guessing, we're told that probably what he's saying is, don't drop it, it's heavy, it looks embarrassing if you drop it in front of a few thousand people. There's the three of us, and I'm looking particularly morose because I hate dressing up in this penguin suit. Here are the beautiful royals, uh, and the king, the queen, uh, the, the, the beautiful princesses, and the prince, and the uh, laureates, the chemistry laureates, and their spouse. Of course, there's corresponding pictures for the other subjects. Uh, then there's this fancy banquet when the Swedes sure know how to throw a party. And I had the fortune to sit next to uh, Princess Madeline, who's a rather charming lady. On her other side was Paul Krugman. Uh, she is shown in this picture talking to me, which was actually a relatively rare event during this dinner, because <laughs> if you were a beautiful princess who is not a scientist, who would you rather talk to? One of the world's most famous experts on economic crises, 2008, <laughs> who can explain to you what's going to happen to the Swedish auto industry? 
uh, and who's really good at explaining things to lay people because he write, does it every t twice a week for the New York Times. Or would you rather talk to somebody about jellyfish? <laughs> But here we actually are talking to each other, and what we found in common is that she, of course, is the youngest of three, and I am the youngest of three, and when she found out that Wendy is the youngest of three, she asked, do you think that youngest children in their families are meant for each other? Because her boyfriend was the youngest of three. <laughs> and I applied, yes, yes. Unfortunately, that boyfriend has subsequently proven unfaithful and has uh, it's broken up, so that's sad. <laughs> Wendy could not complain I had a beautiful young lady to uh, talk to because she had a pretty good looking guy. Uh, this is Prince Carl Philip, and uh, she had, could monopolize him because on his other side was the Japanese, w the wife of one of the Japanese physicists, and she didn't speak either English or Swedish or anything that he could uh, communicate with. So <laughs> Wendy had him all to herself for the entire evening. And the evening does go on a bit because one thing, if I dare say, I, inside secret, you are not allowed to get up from the table as long as the royalty is seated. So you are well advised, and they do advise you, make sure you visit the rest room beforehand because it's going to be a, quite a few hours. So here is the inside of the dining room uh, during this fantastic banquet. This, I guess, is the top table, I think, and halfway down there is the king, and half somewhere up, uh, around there are, are, are us. And these are the waiters bringing in the dessert, which traditionally has these fireworks associated with it. So each one of these is a sort of a, a sparkler that they carry, and with, they carry the whole thing down the length of the hallway while this thing is blazing away. Some other side pictures, you do get to sign a big book with other people's names in it, and they do allow you to ask who do you, whose previous signature or picture do you want to look at, and uh, you might not be surprised that we asked to see Albert Einstein's picture there. They make us give lectures at schools, and here was a young man who was so excited about meeting he, me that he insisted that I sign my name on his torso uh, in ink. <laughs> Uh, which is not easy to do. It, human flesh is not a very easy thing to write on, actually. <laughs> this is the actual weather, and that shows you Wendy on the day after the Nobel. Uh, during the daytime, this is Stockholm City Hall where the um, ceremonies are held. Uh, this is the testament of Nobel himself, um, and it's a really pretty chicken scratchy document. Um, he really had lousy handwriting and a really bad organization. You see it's all scribbled in the margins and all of the things that have grown up in tradition are the interpretation of just these two pages in his will. And finally here is a picture of the uh, paper mache giant green frog with which the Stockholm University students roast the laureates, those who are willing to at least hang around to be roasted. and. We stayed, and uh, uh, it was, we are inducted into the order of the ever-smiling, jumping green frog, which is what we're wearing around our necks. And it takes four people to hold the four legs of a frog. And in this case, I happened, somebody took a picture of me at the front. Uh, uh, Tsutomu Shimomura, son of Osamu, represented his dad, who wasn't feeling well enough. There's Marty Chalfi uh, at the back. And I'm sorry, it's partially obscured. There is Douglas Prasher. And I'm really glad to say that it takes four people to hold up a frog, and that Douglas, as our guest, uh, Marty's and my guest, was able to contribute there, at least. And finally, this is our interpretation of a sunset with a green flash. As you might see it, had we been a little closer to the edge of the cliff, uh, we actually can't see the sunset from our lab, but it's not far off. And uh, this is all drawn, of course, with fluorescent bacteria. So this is the actual living pigments uh, used as our paint. And these are the people in the lab who did the various things that I've mentioned. Uh, none of it by me, by the way. Thank you.